Well, hello. Welcome. Welcome to um, our Champions of the Faith. It's Sunday evening, and uh, I'm honored and privileged to be with you this evening, to spend some time with you. And uh, we're going to talk about today a uh, wonderful man, a man by the name of Charles Finney. And uh, Finney was absolutely remarkable. So let's just give a couple of minutes for it to build up an audience and people to find us on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, big hello to you, Mick. How you doing? Good to see you there, Mick. And Doris as well. Good to see you, Doris. Hi, Susan. Hi, Kalia. Good to see you all uh, this evening. We're going to have a great time tonight. Let's just pray briefly. You know, right now, uh, uh, Brent was probably finished by now. I just expected a text from Elaine and Caroline any minute just to see how it went. And uh, they're in the middle of church at Dorset right now, probably about to finish. You know, I, I know Guildford had a great service today, so we're slowly coming out of lockdown. We're getting to where we need to be. Hi, Allison. Hi, Ashley and Anna Sue. All the A names today. If we decided to uh, introduce ourselves in alphabetical order, uh, hi, Safia. A uh, big hello to Evers on our Facebook group watching. Hello. Uh, we can't get names off the Facebook group. I know you're there. I know you just said hi, all. Um, so hello to you. And, uh, man, it's good to be here today. Um, really is. Really is. We had a great time this morning. There's so many people have texted me and emailed me and let me know how much this morning's really helped them and blessed them. So I'm really grateful for that. Really, really grateful. Okay, awesome. Praise God. Well, let me just let you um, know what's going on in the week before we get into the life of Finney. Um, so uh, on Tuesday night, on Tuesday night, Chris and Vaughn are doing their thing. Um, we got a caption out of the way for you. So Tuesday night, Chris and Vaughn are doing their thing on their Facebook page. You should definitely go along and be part of that. There is no Zoom meeting on Tuesday. Let me say that again. There's no Zoom meeting on Tuesday, there will be one Zoom meeting, even if lockdown completely ends and everything ends, and uh, we can all get out. We'll still have those Zoom meetings once a month. I think they're really beneficial. I think they're really helpful. And so next month, we've got my friend George Odero from Kenya, and uh, the next month's pretty much arranged as well. We've got a couple of people. Bam, we've got some good ones coming up. So just get ready for that. Getting the five-fold ministry there to equip you and train you and help you. Uh, hi to Janet. Um, hi to another one on the Facebook group. Good to see you there. Uh, hi, Fortunate. Hi, Sherry from Oklahoma. Hi, Chris and Vaughn. Good to see you guys here. Hi, Kay. Uh, it's Jill and John. Hey, Jill and John. Good to see you both. Hi, Jill. Hi, John. And um, praise God. Um, so that's basically Tuesday. Wednesday night, Lee is still talking. I don't have a, a graphic for Lee yet or Richard on the Friday. We're going to probably, at the end of July, take those two Friday night and Wednesday night meetings and make it just one night. And then we'll do a rota, me, Lee, Richard, Patience, and you know maybe some of the other pastors as well. But um, we'll probably do a rota. It'll be one night, and uh, we'll pick a theme for the month and just do that, okay, rather than get bombarding you with meetings when you're now starting to go out, and soon we'll be able to go out to living church and so on and so forth. You know, So we're trying to get a balance here. You know, So some things will stay. The storybook's going to stay every Wednesday at half past four. Um, we're going to have communion every Friday at two. Um, we're definitely going to have prayer all this week as well. So starting tomorrow, Monday to Friday, there'll be prayer. Tuesday and Thursday, Amanda and I will still do the praying for the nation. And Friday at two, we'll still have communion. They'll all be on Facebook. And so they'll be there and they won't be stopping, uh, certainly not until at least the end of August. And uh, we'll look through how we examine that. And I will keep doing my question times on Thursday at three. And they're going to go right through now. That's going to be something we do. Unless I'm out of the country or, you know, at a conference or something, we will have those live question times on a Thursday. Praise God. And then next weekend, Saturday night, uh, we're still talking about having faith in God's grace, having faith in God's grace. And the question is, how can I move God? How can I get God to heal me? How can I get God to prosper me? How can I get God to bless me? But well, we're going to answer that question on Saturday night. It might not be the answer you think, but there'll be an answer to that question on Saturday night. And then Sunday morning, Emmanuel asked a really good question about Judas. And it was very interesting because I was I had Judas on my mind because uh, my plan has been for the last couple of weeks <clears throat> in this series about not getting stuck in faith moving forward. You know, every one of the apostles that Jesus appointed, every single one moved forward apart from Judas. He moved backwards. And so he's a great cut case study on how Satan can pierce your heart, deceive you, turn you from being one of Jesus' best friends, one of his 12 members of staff, and uh, you end up backstabbing him and end up a footnote in history. I mean, just horrific. But you know what? Satan can do the same thing today. He's done the same thing today to people. And so you're going to have learn some lessons from Judas next Sunday morning. And then next Sunday evening, we're going to look at Catherine Kuhlman. A lot of people are very excited about that. But this week, we're going to look at Charles 
Finney. That's who we're going to look at this week, okay? So let's get into it, shall we? Let's get into this. Uh, let's get into this. Praise God. Awesome. So evening to Justin, evening to Esther. Uh, good evening, Pastor Solomon uh, from Ireland. Good to have you with us there, Pastor. Um, good uh, evening to Daniel and Maria, to Michelle, to John and Emily. Good to see you guys. Right. Someone once said, one of the books I read, and I've read about eight books on Finney in the last couple of weeks, uh, you can't tell the story of America before the Civil War. You can't tell the story of America before the Civil War without talking about Charles Finney. He was the largest figure there. One history book says he was more important than Abraham Lincoln and uh, Andrew Carnegie. One book actually says he was more influential in ending slavery in America in the 1860s than Abraham Lincoln. That's what one textbook used in schools in the 1890s said, that he actually was more instrumental in ending slavery than Abraham Lincoln. I mean, that's a staggering thing to say about anyone and their role in history. And uh, certainly the most influential Christian, if not the most influential person in America in the 19th century. He came to the UK twice, and a um, remarkable man. Um, in his ministry, in his decades of ministry in America, he personally saw over half a million people come forward and get saved in his meetings, over half a million people. And what he did was he challenged the dead Calvinism of the day. And we're really going to look at that because the whole church was baptized in Calvinism. And uh, there, there's still our church is baptized in that sovereignty of God and baptized in the idea that God controls everything. But Finney was one of the very first to really challenge it and hit it head on and not just say we need to teach differently, but that's not how we should act. And he really examined how people acted in the light of what the Bible teaches and joined, didn't just do what traditionally we do, but say, well, if this is what the Bible says, how should we act? And that's remarkable. And the processes and thoughts he went through we are still reaping the fruit of that. We still do evangelistic crusades the way he did. Billy Graham took did things Finney's way. D.L. Moody did things Finney's way. So a remarkable influence for all of history. Um, most effective evangelist in the 19th century, most innovative. And uh, like I said, we're still benefiting from his ideas today. Um, this, is, this is one of his altar calls. If there is a sinner in the house today, you must abandon every excuse. Because every excuse means nothing. Tonight, it will be spoken of in hell and in heaven what you decide to do. This hour will determine your eternity. Make a choice to submit to God and believe in Jesus right now. Now, he was bold. He asked for a decision, and he got decisions. So let's look into his life, and let's look what he got up to. Charles Grandison Finney was born in America. He was born in Connecticut in August 29, 1792. So he, he was born within several months of Wesley dying, okay? So that's the time period, okay? Wesley's just passed away. Zinzendorf died about 30 years before that. And he was named Charles Grandison Finney. Um, he was named Charles Grandison Finney because his mother had a storybook called Sir Charles Grandison, and it was about a man called Sir Charles Grandison. And his, her mom, his mom loved the storybook, so she called her son, Charles Grandison Finney, because she loved this character from the book. Uh, Mum was called Rebecca. Dad was called Sylvester. They had four daughters and two sons. Charles was son number three. He was child number seven. Okay, so he was the seventh child. And when he was two years old, the whole family and all seven children moved to New York. And at that time, you know, in, in the turn of the 19th century, New York was just a wilderness. And his little brother was born in New York. And then his little, little brother, Sylvester Jr., was born. Dad fought those terrible, terrible Englishmen who were trying to tax their tea. And um, dad fought in the War of Independence. Um, but the family was not religious in any way. There was no religion to the family. Um, Charles said that growing up, he never once heard his dad pray. He never was taken to church. He'd never been to church. He'd never read a religious book as a child. In fact, by his own admission, he never read a book as a child. Um, New York, even then, had a reputation for being hard and uh, for being a place where preachers failed, where churches failed, where nothing worked in New York. It was against the gospel. And that was the reputation of New York even then. <clears throat> Some of you know that my precious friend, Shane Holsgrove, is in New York right now, planting a church. And, uh, you know, we spoke on the phone yesterday and he said, Ben, I see so much need here. The people are so far 
from God. Okay, well, that was New York back then too. And um, age 15, I mean, the, the, you know, life was different then, but at age 15, Charles Finney became a school teacher. There was a real need of teachers in New York, and the family needed money to come in, all those mouths to feed. And um, he was a very smart, very clever, very organized. He was a very method methodical person. And so he became a school teacher at age 15 and would teach the younger children. He wasn't at school long because the family, dad didn't like New York becoming urbanized. So he moved to the outskirts of New York and um, he didn't like the city growing around him. Dad was a rural man. And so Finney found a school in the outskirts of New York. And he became a teacher there. And he was quite a remarkable person. He, he was one of the, the top cello players in America at the time. A uh, remarkable cello player. He was six foot two. So he's one of the tallest men around. He was an athlete. They, they said nobody could outrun Charles Finney. Nobody could outjump him. No one could beat him at sports. So the students at this new school, they loved their new um, teacher because when he got involved in a sport, he was a natural leader, natural captain, and uh, the students would start winning their games. Um, he was a very gifted swimmer, sailor, rower, and he loved his job, loved the kids that he was teaching, and everything was fine, and it was all good. He was a moral man. He wasn't an evil man at all, but he had no idea who God was. He had no idea what the gospel was, no idea who Jesus was. Now, in 1812, we're right on the back of Napoleon trying to rule Europe. The U.S. goes to war with Britain, and Charles decides, I want to join the Navy. I want to fight for my country like my dad fought for my country. I want to go and join the Navy. So he literally quits his job as a teacher and goes to the, the naval yard in New York, and he gets there, and he hears swearing. I mean, he's never heard swearing in his life. He, like I said, he was raised, wasn't raised in a Christian family, but he's raised in a moral family, okay? And he's never heard the swearing like that, and he doesn't like it. And he's being approached by prostitutes at the naval yard, and one of the young girls comes to approach him to offer him to, you know, to pay for her to have sex with him, and he just looks at her, and she looks so pitiful. She looks so broken. She looks so damaged. He just looks at her and starts to cry, that this woman would try and offer sex to him for money. And he just stands there and cries, and uh, she starts to cry. And they both just stand there crying. Charles Finney is a, an old man. Even 50 years after that, even 50 years after that, he said that the greatest regret of my life was not being able to offer that girl at that moment the grace of God and the goodness of God because I didn't have it, and I couldn't offer it because I didn't have it. So he, he sees the sailors and the way the sailors are behaving and the language and the attitude and the, the, the prostitutes following the Navy around. And he says, I can't join the Navy. So he returns to Connecticut, which is where he was born, um, and uh, because someone he knew there managed to get him a job as a teacher. And um, he gets a job, and he does quite well, and he does a couple of teaching jobs. And he ends up in New Jersey teaching. And um, while he was teaching, he was also studying as well. So he learned Latin, he learned Greek, and he learned Hebrew. He said, I never learned enough not to dare not read the Bible in English. But as he was studying his Latin, as he was studying Greek, as he was studying Hebrew, as part of his academic training, he was reading the Bible. And he thought, you know what? I'm just going to try church. I want to see what goes on in a church service. I've never been to church. So out of curiosity, he goes to church. And when he goes to church, he said it was just boring, just absolutely boring. He said, well, it wasn't that I hated it. it. It was too bland to be hated. It just left no impression on me. It was just dull. And so he, he got an opportunity to go to Yale because he was very smart. And uh, But his lecturer who was teaching Greek and Hebrew and Latin said, it's a waste of time you going to Yale because you would actually learn more just learning by yourself. So in 1818, Charles is 26 years old, and he decides to change the whole course of his life and decides, I'll become a lawyer. A lawyer can make a lot of money, and I'd like to be rich. And so he studied at law school, and they said, would you like to lecture? Because you're so clever. Would you like to lecture as soon as you're finished? So he did. And then he decided, no, I'll make a good lawyer. And so he started working for a judge and um, started learning the law part-time. He had a great mind for law, and he became a remarkable young lawyer, absolutely remarkably gifted lawyer. So he, he got a job in Adams in New York, very near to where his parents lived, and he wanted to be closer to his parents. He was tired of being away from them, and he started working for this judge in New York called Ben Wright. 
Now, in Adams, Finney bumps into a man, not, not going to the church, but he bumps into a man in the course of his job, the Reverend George Gale. Now, Reverend George Gale is the, t the town pastor. There's one church in Adams. It's a little town, new town, and it's a Presbyterian church, and Gale is the minister there, George Gale. And um, he likes George. They're, they're friends. They're both young men. They're both professionals, and they like each other. So they go and have lunch, and they go out, and they spend time together. And so he's now got a friend who's a vicar. Now, Gale is trying to talk to Finney, his new friend, about Jesus, as you do. And um, he said, this is the hardest man ever to talk to about Jesus. Finney is too hard to talk to about Jesus. And in fact, at the midweek prayer meeting in the church, they got a midweek prayer meeting. And like, what should we pray for today, people? In the midweek prayer meeting, somebody says, hey, pastor, let's pray for your lawyer friend to get saved. Let's pray for him. And uh, Gail, the minister, says there's no point in praying for him. He's so hard-hearted, he'll never get saved. He just argues about the Bible. He's got no respect for God's word. Let's not even waste time praying for him. That's what the minister actually told the people when they offered to pray for his friend. Okay. Well, maybe Charles heard that happened. I don't know. Or maybe someone went home and prayed anyway for Charles. But um, what happened next was that Charles decided, I want to go to this prayer meeting with you, uh, Reverend. So he went to the prayer meeting, and he didn't get the prayer meeting, didn't make sense to him. He just really went to see what was going on, and he was curious about what was going on, and um, he had a lot of questions, and he felt nobody could answer his questions about prayer. How does prayer work? Why do we pray? Why do we meet together and pray? How, how, how do we get answers to our prayer? And he had all these questions, and he felt no one had an answer for him. Okay. So just think about that. He's going to the prayer meeting and no one can answer his questions. Okay, Justin says the stream's coming out. Other people say it's not. So I'm going to go with not. Um, hi, Ben. I don't know who you are on the Facebook user, but good to see you. Blessings. Thank you. Uh, Giovanna, good to see you, Giovanna. Really good to have you with us again. Awesome. Good to see you, Sarah. Good to see you, Sarah. Mellon. Awesome. And Rose. Excellent. Rose is listening in from Kenya. Chris Barhost is listening in from uh, the US. So, man, we've got an international audience tonight, haven't we? That's awesome. Praise God. So anyway, where were we? Uh, Charles, you know, he's studying for the law. And he's studying to be a lawyer. And what he found out was that most of the law books are quoting the Bible. We know this is a good law because of the Bible. We know this law is good because the Bible says so. And so the Bible was underpinning the authority of law in America. And most of the laws were based on the Bible. So he would get a he got himself a Bible so he could look up the Bible to check his law books to make sure they were quoting the Bible correctly. Okay, that's why he got a Bible to help him in his law studies. But what happened was, was he'd open his Bible to, to read a scripture um, to help with his law studies, but he found he kept reading it. And he found himself getting interested in the Bible as the Bible. Let me read a quote from the man. As I was reading my Bible and going regularly to prayer meetings and going to church, I started listening to Mr. Gale preach, and I would have lunch with him regularly. And I spoke to the elders in the church and other people in the church, and there was a restlessness inside me. A little thought convinced me that I was not in a place where if I died, I would go to heaven. And I wanted to settle that issue as soon as possible. I needed to change my inward state so I was ready for heaven and I did not know how to do this. But I did know this. This question is far too important for me to stay on the fence with this issue. So he knew something had to change, but nobody could really help him. Awesome. Hello to Joseph. Good to have you with us. Um, the, the, the stream is fine for Lee. That's good to hear. Carl Scott's here. Good to see you, Pastor Carl. And Lee is listening from Dartford. That's awesome. I believe that counts as a, a galaxy far, far away. Hello, Dartford. So the big issue for Finney was this. He'd go to that prayer meeting every week, and he never once saw a prayer get answered. He never once saw a prayer get answered. He'd read his Bible, and his Bible would say, ask and you shall receive. And then he'd go to this Christian prayer meeting. Everyone's asking, 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 and no one is receiving. He'd read in his Bible, God will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for his children, and God's a good father, and he won't withhold anything. And he's going to the prayer meeting, and they're praying and praying and praying, and nothing's happening. And that's actually putting him off the Bible. It's putting him off church. It's putting him off everything, putting him off God. And so he told the people at the prayer meeting one day, I'm, I'm going to give up. 
I'm going to stop coming. This will be my last time here. It's been lovely to meet you. You've all been very kind, but I can't keep coming. And so their response to that was to say, why don't we pray for you? Let's pray for you um, today. And he said, <laughs> I love his answer, very direct and very to the point. Listen to this. This is what he said. I, I definitely need prayer. I know I do. I'm a sinner, and I'm very aware that I'm a sinner. I'm not going to go to heaven if I die right now. But if you pray for me, it won't do any good. I watch you week after week, and you're asking and you're asking, but you never receive a thing. You've been praying for revival since I've lived here, and there's no revival. You've been praying for the Holy Spirit to fall, and no Holy Spirit has fallen. You're all lean Christians. You've prayed enough for every devil to leave this town, but your prayers have no virtue and no power, and this town is getting worse, not better. You pray, but then all you do is complain. Your prayers never work. So I'd rather you didn't pray for me. I mean, he wasn't trying to insult them. He really wasn't. He had his lawyer's mind out, and he was just being honest about where he was and what was going on. And he left that meeting out of sorts. He went back home, and he wrote in his diary, I need a savior, but no one can tell me where he is. Man. Think about that. Now, what's going on? Let's, let, let, let's pull back and look at the wider picture for a minute, because this is important in terms of what we believe and why we believe. And so <clears throat> the church in America, at that sort of stage, sort of the turn of the 19th century, was in a very strange place. About a generation ago, there'd been a lot of religious passion. You had Wesley and Whitfield, and you had what was called the First Great Awakening. Jonathan Edwards was part of that as well. And you have this great big revival going on across the country. Now, Whitfield, who preached in America a lot more than Wesley, Whitfield was a five-point Calvinist. Now, I don't want to go too deep in theology today, but basically, and I've got a video called The Sovereignty of God. I've got two videos, one about can we blame God for tragedy, and two about Romans 8.28 that I recorded just a few weeks ago on our YouTube channel, where I go a bit deeper into the Word. But basically... Whitfield believed in the sovereignty of God. He believed that God controlled everything that happened in the world. Wesley did not believe that. And I'm on Wesley's side here, very much so. Okay, I preached on this. Like I said, God's not in control. Um, a week on, we can't blame him. A week on, you know, Romans 8, 28. Now, Calvinism was the only belief of the churches in America in the 19th century. And so with very few exceptions, very, very few exceptions, every Christian believed the following. Okay, number one, they believed that God only wanted to get some people saved, not everyone. That's what they believed. Okay, think about it. Okay, they were watching very few people get saved. Okay, they weren't seeing much fruit in their church. So rather than say, man, we need to change what we're doing. We need to get right with God. We need to repent. We need to get a bigger vision. We need to really ask the Lord what we need to do differently. Rather than do all that and, and deal with it themselves, they went, oh, well, that must be God's will. So God's will was only to save a few people. Everyone else, God did not want to save, okay? And they believed that the, these people that God wanted to save were called the elect. And what they believed was that you could never know this side of heaven whether you're in the elect. So you could never know you were saved. You could never be confident you were a Christian. So you had to live really holy and say sorry for all your sins, and try and make sure you're one of the elect, and if you don't live holy, God's going to make sure you're not one of the elect, and you're not going to be a good, you're not going to get to heaven. So though you were saved by grace, God chose who to give the grace to. They didn't believe in what I preached on a couple of Sundays ago, universal grace. They didn't believe that the born-again experience was for everyone, it was only for some people. And the most famous sermon of that first great awakening was a sermon by Jonathan Edwards, you may have heard the title, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And that is how people saw themselves, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now, I don't want to pick Edwards apart. He had some good things for him. He was a man of faith, and he was expecting things to happen when he preached. But when he preached that sermon about sinners in the hands of an angry God, people in his church killed themselves. People were so, he put so much weight on people and so much condemnation on people. People, Even his own uncle killed himself because his preaching was so negative and beat people up so much. And then when he heard that people had killed themselves, his response was, well, that's God's will for their life. God wanted them to kill themselves. Okay, that's what Calvinism does. It messes up your mind because you think everything's God. Therefore, if everything's God, everything must be good. And that's not true. Some things are good and some things are evil. Everyone saw themselves as a sinner in the hand of God. And here's the point. 
I'm not going to argue with you whether the world is sinners in the hands of an angry God. I've got my opinion on that. But for the sake of this, I want to tell you, if you're born again today, if you are a born again Christian today, you are not a sinner in the hands of an angry God. You are a saint in the hands of a loving father. That is what you are. Okay. And so for them, for the Calvinists, salvation was seen as a miracle. And miracles only happened if God wanted to do a miracle. It was nothing to do with us. If God wanted to get someone saved, they'd just get saved. Now, I don't want to have a debate on doctrine in this video, but the doctrine is vital to what Finney did next. Understanding this is vital to understanding Finney. You have to put him in the context of what was going on around him. Finney's ministry, the way he taught the gospel, the way he preached, the way he saw people born again, was an assault on Calvinism. It was an aggressive assault on the idea that God controls everything. God only wants to save a very few number of people, and God only wants to save the ones he wants to save. He came against that. And if you find today, if you find someone today, and there's a lot of them out there, if you find a book written against Finney, if you find a book attacking Finney, I will bet you, I'll bet you this bottle of Coke, I'll bet you this bottle of Coke, other soft drinks are available, but I'll bet you that bottle of Coke, that I'll bet you a a full one, a new one from the shops, I bet you the person who wrote that book is a Calvinist. I bet you they turn out to be a five-point Calvinist because Finney's ministry cut against this idea of the sovereignty of God, of the limited nature of the atonement, and he preached that God died for everyone. But how did he get there? How did Finney get there? Okay, so here's Finney. He wants to be saved. He knows he needs a savior. He knows he hasn't lived right, and he hasn't lived in such a way that's going to get into heaven. He's reading his Bible every day. He's going to church two or three times a week. He's praying every day. And all he hears from the Christians is, try harder. Keep going. You're never going to know if you're saved. Our prayers don't do anything because God will just do what he wants anyway. But you have to pray because if you don't pray, you're not good. And if you're not good, you're not going to get to heaven. So you better pray. But don't expect an answer to your prayer. We're not praying to get an answer. We're praying to be considered one of the good people. They weren't praying to get results. They were praying to hopefully be considered one of God's chosen. You had to pray because Christians have to pray. But the idea that you could receive from God was alien to them. And Charles decided no one in the church can help me. No Christian can help me. So I'm going to get answers. It has to be from the Bible. And he decided, and that's what he decided. I'm going to read my Bible, not as a Christian, not as a sinner. I'm going to read my Bible as a lawyer. I'm going to read it like it is the testimony of a witness in court. I'm going to cross-examine my Bible, and I'm going to see, is it a bad witness? And what he decided after reading his Bible like a lawyer was that the Bible was a good witness, but what was being preached in the church was a bad witness. He decided that if God was good, and good means he was a good judge, and he knew about judges because he worked in the courts, and then the Bible was God's law. Then the Bible has to be a true witness. And if the Bible's true, what he read in the Bible is not what was being preached in the churches. So therefore, the churches must be a false witness. And he decided, I believe the Bible's true. And what he found out from the Bible is what anyone who's been associated with tree of life for any length of time knows, you can choose. You can choose life or choose death. You can choose Christ or you can choose to be a heathen. You can choose to go to heaven or choose to go to hell. You can choose to be healed or choose not to be healed. You can choose to be a success in life or you can choose not to be a success. You can walk in the blessings or walk in the curse. And Finney said, God has given us a choice. We can choose life or choose death. So we have to tell people to make a choice. And anyone can make a choice. Anyone can get saved. Anyone can receive the grace. The grace isn't just for some people. So Finney's got that right now in his head, but he's still not saved himself. It's now Saturday night. It's October. It's 1821. Charles is 29 years old now. And he decides, I'm going to make a decision today because this is about eternity. This is about my soul. This is about everything that matters. I'm going to sort this out today. So He's been reading his Bible day and night. He's been working long hours as a lawyer. He's not getting much out of the church, but he's still going. And um, he was working all day that Saturday. Even back then, lawyers worked long hours. And he was sitting there. I can't make the decision in the office. And he suddenly felt really self-conscious that he had a Bible in his office as a lawyer. And so he didn't mind if people saw him reading the Bible, but he was reading it as part of his law studies. But now he was reading it personally. Now, you know, someone would come into the office. He'd hide his Bible under a law book 
And when he prayed, he'd put paper in the keyhole to the door of his office so that no one could see him praying. And he decided, I can't make the decision. And then Sunday came and he decided, I can't make the decision. Monday came and I can't make the decision. Tuesday, he woke up and he went, what if I die today? I'm going to go to hell. I've got to make a decision for Jesus. And then Tuesday, he actually lost his voice. He got a little bit unwell Tuesday and lost his voice. Well, how can I ask God for mercy if I can't even speak? So Wednesday morning, it's October 10th, 1821. Charles is up early getting ready for work and he's reading his Bible um, before he goes to work. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him. He heard the Holy Spirit speak to him. And the Holy Spirit said, what are you waiting for? The Holy Spirit said, you made a promise that you're going to give your heart to God. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to work out your own righteousness? That's what the Holy Spirit asked him. And as he heard those questions, Finney suddenly realized all the stuff he'd written in the Bible suddenly came alive to him. And he suddenly realized how awesome the good news is. It was like his heart opened up to the complete work of Christ. Again, from, his, from one of his sermons. I saw that the work of Christ was finished. It was totally finished. I no longer needed my own righteousness to get to Christ, to get recommended to God. What I had to do was not try and build my own righteousness, but submit myself to the righteousness of God that was available through Christ. Gospel salvation is not something we achieve. It is an offer we need to accept. And the offer is full and the offer is complete. And all that is necessary in your part is to consent to the offer, to give up your sins and accept Christ. Salvation suddenly appeared before me, not as something I had to work up with my works, but a thing that is found entirely in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is my God and my Savior. Now, Finney didn't realize as he was working this all through that, you know, you, you know when you've got to go to work in the morning, you don't kind of think, you know, you're on robot mode. Well, Finney had got dressed while he was thinking it through. He was walking while he was thinking it all through. And he was actually in the middle of the street. He'd already left for work, was walking to work, and he realized where he was. I've got myself all ready for work. I've been, you know, thinking about my salvation so much. And the Holy Spirit said, will you accept your salvation today? And he said, yes, I will, or I'll die trying. He still had a try mentality. So Finney decides, I'm not going to go into work. I'm going to go into a local forest, get on my own, and I'm going to pray, and I'll be able to pray loudly and call it to God for mercy. So he snuck into the forest. He's looking around. Doesn't want anyone to see that he's going. Doesn't want anyone to see what he's doing. He's a bit nervous. And he snuck in under a fence. It means no one saw him into the forest. And he walked into the forest and he found a little glade surrounded by trees. So he was safe. And he said, I'm going to give my heart to God here or I'm going to die here. And so he heard a noise in the forest. He heard a noise in the forest. Oh, someone's followed me. Someone's watching me. He became paranoid. And then he realized, wow, that's so much pride. A real pride. If I'm, why would I be terrified of what people think of me when I'm praying? Why would I be scared of what people think I'm doing when I want to pray to God? I think, oh my goodness, I'm so proud. I can't repent. I can't get the grace of God. And I can't get saved. I'm too late to get saved. A common teaching of the day. In fact, um, Amanda encountered this. She was listening to a sermon this week and somebody said this. You, it can be too late for you to get saved. Nope. If there's life, there's hope. Okay, it's not too late for you to get saved. You're not too far gone for Jesus. But, you know, someone teaching that, and if I said the name, you'd all know the name of the teacher, and they taught that this week, and, you know, that's that's wrong. It's never too late to get saved. It was a very common teaching back then. If you missed your moment, you missed your moment. Um, I don't know how you can have that teaching alongside God will do whatever God's going to do anyway. I don't know how the two fit together, but they, they didn't think these things through. And Finney was starting to get scared. It was too late to get saved. And he felt kind of foolish. People was watching him. He said, oh, I can't leave here. I can't leave here without praying. I can't leave here unchanged. And then he kind of realized, if I am more concerned that someone should see me pray than I am concerned that I get myself saved, man, I'm in the wrong place. I need to sort this right now. So he got down on his knees. He said, God, I need mercy. I need mercy. And the Lord spoke to him, spoke to him a, a verse from Jeremiah 29. I will listen to you and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. And he said, Lord, I believe in you. I will search for you all my days, and I'll know that you'll listen to every prayer I pray, and I will find you. And suddenly, all these promises from the Bible that he'd read again and again jumped to his mind. He said, I accept every promise. 
He said it was like a, a man drowning had grabbed a branch. And he realized he was saved. He realized all he had to do was trust in Jesus. All he had to do was put his hope in Jesus, his righteousness, not mine. And he said, right, I'm saved. I'm going back to work. And he got up and he started walking into town. He had no idea what time it was. He had no idea how long he'd been there. And as he's walking into town, he thinks, you know what? I'm going to preach the gospel. So I'm just up in the AC a little bit. It's getting warm in here. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel. That's what he started saying out loud. I'm going to preach the gospel. And as he started walking back to work, he thought, something has changed. I don't feel guilty at all. And again, the church was teaching, you've got to feel guilty because you're vile. Every one of you should feel guilty because you're all vile and horrible. And you're, you're horrible before God. And how could God possibly like you unless you come before him in sackcloth and ashes? And, and finish there going, God promised me salvation. I believe the promise and I'm saved. I'm totally saved. I'm the righteousness of God. I don't have to feel guilty. And he felt so excited. He got back to town and it was uh, dinner time, tea time. And the whole day had gone. And he thought, I'm not hungry. I want to go and do some work. I'm a bit behind my work. I just spent the day in the forest. And so when he got to work, no one was there because the judge had taken everyone in the office out for dinner. And so he was alone in his work. He had a, he had a viola in his office, as you do. And uh, he started to play his viola. And he started singing worship songs to God. And he started crying and crying, just praising God for his great salvation. And he got so emotional, so overwhelmed by the fact that God accepted him, that God loved him. They couldn't sing anymore. And he just sat on the floor in his office and said, it's so simple. Salvation is just trusting God's promise. God speaks and we just believe that God means what he says. We just take God at his word. We get saved. Well, everyone comes back from dinner and the judge has made a plan to move the offices around. Not Finney's, but a lot of other people are going to be in different offices. And so people are moving books and bookcases and moving stuff around. And no one's chatting because they're all so busy. Well, Charles is still sitting on the floor in the middle of his office, just overwhelmed by the peace of God. I don't have any guilt anymore. I don't have any anxiety anymore. And so it's now dark and the judge is about to go. So he just goes round and he says goodbye to everyone who's still working. And he comes in to say goodnight to Charles and he does. And then the judge walks out. And as um, the judge leaves the, the building, Charles has a vision of Jesus. And he suddenly sees Jesus standing there right in front of him. And he said at the time, it just seemed so natural that Jesus would be there. He didn't realize it was a vision, just Jesus would be there. And um, Jesus just looked at him and he said, I could see this look of love in his eyes. That Jesus just loved me. He just loved me so much. And Charles fell at the feet of the Jesus. Jesus was standing in the room. Charles fell, laid down at his feet and just started weeping. He started confessing all his old sins. He started worshiping and he kind of ran out of stuff to say. I don't know what to say to Jesus. I don't know what to do. Jesus is in the room. And then Jesus reached and touched him. And as Jesus touched him, he felt the power of the Holy Spirit go through him. He said it was like waves of electricity. It was like liquid love was being poured into me. I have no other way of expressing it, he said, than liquid love or electricity being poured into me. It was like the very breath of God was bringing new life to everything around me. And then suddenly Charles started speaking. Now, Charles never uses the phrase speaking in tongues, but he uses phrases like I was speaking in unutterable gushings in languages that man could not possibly say. And basically what happened was Charles started speaking in tongues. He got baptized in the Holy Ghost and he started speaking in tongues. He said, as I started speaking in tongues, I started gushing. Um, the waves just kept coming over me and over me, the waves of love, the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. He said, if there was one more wave, it would have just taken me all the way to heaven. I just knew how much God loved me. And he lay there on the office floor. It was now in the middle of the night. And so what happened was Charles hadn't gone to the church meeting. There was a church meeting that night and Charles had missed it. So one of the choir decided, I just want to make sure Charles is okay. I know he often works late. So I'll go to his office and see if he's okay. And so, you know, maybe I can pray for him. So he walks into the office room. There's Charles lying on the floor, having just met Jesus, speaking in tongues. And the church member sees him lying on the floor, speaking in tongues. And the church member goes, are you sick? What's wrong with you? Are you in pain? And Charles rolls over and says, I'm so happy I can't live anymore. That's what he said. I'm so happy I can't live anymore. Well, the church member looks at him, thinks he's gone mental, runs across the road because there's an elder, lives in a house across the street, and he gets the elder. He says, you've got to come, you've got to come. And so they both go to Charles. The elder comes into the room, and he looks at Charles lying on the floor, worshipping in tongues, and he says, are you sick? 
And Charles reaches out and touches the elder. And the elder was famous in the town for being a really strict, miserable, grumpy elder. I know they exist, not in Tree of Life, I'm sure. But, you know, this guy had a reputation for just being grumpy and uh, miserable. And he starts laughing. When Charles touches him, the elder just starts laughing and laughing and laughing. He laughs so much, he falls to the ground. The presence of God fills the whole room. Well... There's another man who goes to the church and he's been having some conversations with Charles about salvation. And he decides, let's have another chat with Charles about salvation. I want to get saved. And so he decides I'm going to turn up at midnight at Charles' office and have a conversation with him about salvation. And so he turns up, he walks into the room and he's got his Bible with him to discuss Bible with Charles. And as he walks into the room, the presence of God is so strong. He falls to his knees and says, pray for me. And they pray for him and he gets saved. And then they all get up and they all go home. Charles is now at home. It's about, you know, early hours of the night. And he's lying in bed thinking, that elder laughed. That was strange. And am I being mocked by God? Was he laughing because I'm funny? But I just feel so much peace with God. And he fell asleep. And he, he, what happened was he woke up an hour later praying in tongues and praising God for how much God loved him. And then he's going, no, God can't love me that much. His brain started getting involved. Ever had that happen? And his brain started kicking in going, no, God can't love you that much. And he started doubting it. And when he doubted it, all the praise left and everything kind of peered out. And he fell asleep. And then about an hour later, he'd wake up again. And he's praising God and worshiping God in tongues. And God loves me so much. And then he kind of gets his brain involved and go back to sleep. And this happened all night. Just kept waking up, praising God in tongues and thanking God for his love. Well, the next morning, Charles gets out of bed and he says, I felt glorious. I love God. And he opens his mouth. And the first words he says when his feet hit the floor in the morning is, I cannot doubt this is God. I am righteous by God, with God. And by faith, I have peace with God. That's scripture, Romans 5.1. We are made righteous by faith and therefore have peace with God. That was one of Finney's favorite scriptures. And he'd teach it a lot. He'd tell people, you're not saved by being elect. You're saved by faith. You're made righteous by believing. And faith alone will make you totally righteous. And Charles realized that first day of being a Christian, that when you know Jesus, there's no more guilt. There's no more condemnation. Jesus paid the whole price. So he goes to work, not to do law. He goes to work because he knows all those people. And he's going to tell them about Jesus. He's been saved one day. And the first thing he does is go and meet his boss, Judge Wright, who gets so offended at Charles sharing the gospel with him, he storms out the office. And then he comes back in and then says, no, actually, I need this. I want to get saved. And the first person Finney leads to the Lord, besides the church member who turned up at midnight, is his own boss. And then his first client for the day came in, and his client was a deacon in the church. And Charles says, I can't plead your case. And the deacon says, why can't you plead my case? He said, well, God spoke to me and said, I can only plead one case right now, and that's the case of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the deacon went, I'm devastated. You're a good lawyer. And the deacon went, well, if you're just going to obey God, I'm, I'm going to dedicate my life to God as well. And the deacon went home, got on his knees, and dedicated his life to God. Getting born again totally changed Finney. And I think we need to remember this. This is something we must learn. When you are born again, you are totally changed. You've got a whole new nature. And you can benefit. Every one of you is born again. You can benefit from the lack of guilt, the lack of condemnation, the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know why? Because you've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. And one of the reasons why we don't have a changed life is we don't believe it's changed. If you started today believing you're totally new, you're a new creation, and you started to believe that you're a new creation, you'd start benefit from being a new creation. But Charles Finney took his law mind, took his law brain, said, well, God says it, we can trust it. It's a reliable witness. Therefore, we can trust the testimony. And if God says I'm free from guilt, I'm free from guilt. Well, the deacon went home, and Charles was sitting in his office, and uh, the place is very quiet, so Charles thought, well, I need to find someone to share my faith with. So he went about it, around the streets, around the town, and he started leading people to the Lord all over town, okay? He did what Amanda does, you know? He just went, I need to tell you about Jesus, and I'll tell you about Jesus. And he'd say, are you saved? Are you saved? And he started asking people all around the town, and everyone's getting saved, and everyone's talking about Charles Finney, this newly converted lawyer on the streets of the town, Adams, just leading people to the Lord all day. And um, so he finally gets back to Reverend Gale, and uh, Reverend Gale's first thought is, Finney's playing a game. This is a strange game. 
Well, they get to the prayer meeting that night, and the only topic of conversation, the only thing they're all talking about is, have you heard of what happened to Finney? And Finney's out on, on the streets all day getting people saved. So someone said, go and find him. So they went and found him, and they brought him to church. And they said, could you talk to us all about what's happened? So he gets up and he says, I am absolutely convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus is God. And he gets his Bible out. And like a lawyer, he makes the case that Jesus is God. He makes the case that salvation is only by faith. And he makes the case that we have to choose life and make a decision for Christ. And the people are just sitting there overwhelmed by this powerful message. And then he says, the greatest evidence, of course, is I have met God. And now I know God. I've encountered God. And so Charles finished preaching. He preached for about half an hour. Reverend Gale gets up to the front and he says, I publicly repent of my unbelief. I did not believe this man could get saved. And I don't really believe God can change the town. And my unbelief is holding the whole church back. Charles, pray for us. And Charles got up and he said, anyone wants to get saved, I will pray for you. And he started praying. People started getting saved. So the church now is holding nightly meetings with Charles preaching the gospel. He's only been saved a couple of days. And what happened, first of all, before anything else happened, was everyone in the church got saved. Because a lot of people in the church were not saved because no one preached the gospel to them. Because they heard the gospel. They found out the power that's in God's word. Then it entered their hearts and pierced them. You know, I talked this morning about the piercings of Satan. But there's a piercing of God's word. There's a piercing of the word of the Lord. And it'll get you saved. And it'll get you healed. And it'll get you baptized. But we've got to preach the word. We can't just say, well, God's going to do what God's going to do. We can't say, we never know what God's going to do. We can't just say, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's not. You have to believe in the grace of God. And you have to believe what God has done. So Charles then decides, I'm going to go back home and share the gospel with my mum and dad. Now, his brother George had already got saved. He didn't know that. And George didn't know that Charles had just got saved. And they met each other. But there's, you know, a whole bunch of other brothers and sisters not saved. And the parents aren't saved. And he led his parents to the Lord. He sat down with his parents and led them to the Lord. And so where they live, they live right next to a Baptist church. So they all decided to go to the Baptist church that night. And the Baptist church was having a meeting. And... Uh, Finney gets up, and to cut a long story short, all the Baptists get saved. The next night, they found out there was a Congregationalist church in the town meeting. They go there, and the Congregationalists get saved. So Finney comes back from seeing all these people saved in three different churches and says, you know what? I need to be a minister. And they said, what kind of ministry? He said, well, Presbyterian. That's the first church I went to. He said, there's a problem, though. Is that, I, I believe God's called me to be a minister, but I've never met a minister I want to be like. Finney later admitted, he didn't say that there's nothing in his biography, but there's a couple of sermons where he said, one of the reasons it took me so long to get saved was because I knew God wanted me to be a minister and I didn't want to be one of those ministers. And I understand that. I understand that. I didn't have very good role models as ministers when I got saved. I didn't. And I knew God called the day I got saved, God told me to, God called me to ministry. So they told Finney, go and study in Princeton. That's the best place to Princeton. And he said, I've never heard a graduate from Princeton I have never had a graduate from Princeton preach a sermon with any fruit. So I'm not going to go there. Man, you've got to realize fruit's so important. Okay? It's not about someone's pedigree. It's about their fruit. And Charles Finney even then said, look, that's the top Bible college. That's where everyone goes. Well, where's the fruit? Where's the people who have come out of that place who are changing the world? Oh, I don't see any. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to want to go somewhere that's going to help me get ready to prepare the Lord. And I really believe this. I really believe that if Finney had gone to Bible college where they wanted him to go, I believe it would have destroyed him. I believe he wouldn't have had the ministry he had. I believe it would have either pushed him into Calvinism, it would have made him as dead as the other ministers coming out, it would have molded him. And so if you're thinking of going to Bible college, just look at the fruit. Ask that Bible college, tell me the names of free graduates who right now are in ministry, doing the will of God, changing lives, extending the kingdom. Tell me about them. Tell me about them. Find out what the fruit is. Listen to someone who's been there and preaches. Anyway. So what they agreed to do, the Presbyterians said, you can train one-on-one -on -one with Reverend Gale. We respect Reverend Gale, very qualified man, and you can train one-on-one. -on -one. And so Gale gave him all the lessons he would have got at Bible college. But because he knew Charles, Charles could then say, well, actually, I disagree with that. And I disagree with that. And Charles realized that he could reject Calvinism and reject the system of belief, but not get kicked out of the church. And Charles was a massive reader. He just read so much. 
he, you know, don't know his law reading, but he was reading all these Christian books, all the books by Wesley, by Whitfield, everyone. But what he said was, everything you read has to come back to the word. And because of that, I cannot embrace Calvinism. I cannot embrace that Jesus only died for some people. I cannot embrace that it's not God's will for everyone to be saved. I can't embrace that thought. Every person has the deciding vote to where they spend eternity. It's not God's vote. It's not Satan's vote. They have the vote. You get to vote on where you spend eternity. Now, do not underestimate how radical that was as an idea back then. Because for most of you, that's not a radical idea. But back then, before Finney came along in America, and with the exception of some of the Methodists across the UK as well, everybody was wrapped up in the sovereignty of God. Everybody was wrapped up in this idea. And you know what my views are on that. I'm sure you do. But think about how it relates to salvation. Let's say I turn up at church on Sunday. And there's 100 people there. And let's say 10 of them aren't born again. They don't know Jesus. Well, if I believe, well, God will only save who God wants to save. And those people, some people will be saved no matter what. Why, why would I preach the gospel to them? If someone turned up at church on Sunday, imagine right in Dorset right now, somebody walks in the door and says, help me, I can't sleep. What must I do to be saved? You know, imagine if Richard's answer would be, well, just try and be good. And maybe if you are good, you'll be one of the lucky ones. And if you're one of the lucky ones, God will save you. If not, he's never going to save you anyway. So what's the point? That was literally what was happening back then. You know, even today, praise God, even the churches that really believe that, and there are churches that still believe that today, most of them still think to get people saved, you've got to preach the word. And so thank God they're preaching the word. But it was Finney that brought that to the church. Finney challenged that across the whole church in all of America. And he got up and he preached the gospel. And then he'd say, right, I've preached the gospel. This is the gospel. Now make a response to the gospel. Make a decision for Christ. Now, no Calvinist would teach that. No Calvinist would do that. Finney didn't just challenge the teachings. He thought, right, if this is what we believe, if this is what the Bible says, how do we act on that? How do we behave? We act based on what the Bible said. During Finney's time at his one-on-one -on -one Bible school with Reverend Gale, during his time there, he was preaching every week. 800 people got born again in two years. 800 people people and another 200 people got saved who were in the church anyway elders got saved deacons got saved they were not christians they started a prayer meeting for men just men at dawn every day and the church was full men just praying every day believing god expecting god and finney if they weren't there finney would go and knock on their door at dawn and say come on then get to church get to pray one of the areas in which Finney, because of his new th teaching, because of what he was reading in the Bible, that he changed practice from the whole church was prayer. Finney would often pray, he'd often fast, and he realized, God, prayer is to get an answer. We're not praying to be spiritual. We're not praying to get brownie points. We're praying to get that prayer answered. And so he'd go back to that forest where he got saved, that glade where he got saved regularly, and he'd just be alone with God. He'd say, God, I need your wisdom. I need you to change my life. I need you to change my attitudes. I need you. And he'd say, Look, Lord, give me the wisdom I need to look to Jesus properly. That's, that's how he prayed. That's a great prayer. He used to say that when he prayed, he could feel the presence of God. And then when he studied and worshipped, he was ready to do anything because he knew what God wanted. And he found out that the more he prayed, the easier it was when he preached to persuade people to accept Christ. Finney had a supernatural ministry. A lot of his biographies play that down. But he had a supernatural ministry, had a healing ministry. Judge, Judge Wright, his old boss, his sister-in-law got very, very ill. And um, the doctor said she'd be dead the next day. She wouldn't last one day. When Charles heard she was sick, he said, it was like someone had shot an arrow in my heart. The burden crushed me. And I couldn't understand the nature of it. But all I wanted to do was go and pray for that woman. So he started praying in tongues. And he walked from the church to his office and back again and back again and back again. After six journeys, he felt a real peace that he prayed and the prayer would be answered. And she wouldn't just live, but she's going to get born again too. And he told the judge the next morning she was completely healed, not sick at all. And three days later, she got born again and she became part of the church. Amen. Prayer works. When we've got to pray in faith, when we pray when the Lord leads us to pray, prayer works. Charles believed the full power of ministry is the power of the Holy Spirit. He told every preacher, if you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, your ministry won't work. 
He said, the reason why there's no fruit in most ministers is there's no Holy Spirit in most ministers. They don't fellowship with the Holy Spirit. They don't listen to the Holy Spirit. He said to every minister, before you minister, go and have your own personal Pentecost or you will never have success. In 1824, the board of Presbyterians came to ordain Charles for ministry and he had to answer a series of questions and uh, miraculously, somehow, he said, I'm going to answer them honestly. And if they don't ordain me, they don't ordain me. But the, every question they asked was one he agreed with. It was about, you know, Jesus being God and about this and about that. They never asked a single question or any of these points of disagreement. And so they ordained him. They unanimously, 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 unanimously voted to ordain him as a Presbyterian minister. And so he had no desire to pastor. They said, do you want a church? He said, not really. I don't want a church. I want to pastor a church. Um, so he joined a missionary group in New York, which was holding meetings to get women saved. It was a women's ministry. And um, they said, well, we'll just send you out to help get anyone saved. We'll just send you anywhere. And so he'd go around preaching. Um, just after he got ordained, he got engaged to a lady called Lydia, Lydia Andrews. She lived in Whitestown and on Ida. Now, they got married in April. Now, they'd known each other. This is interesting because they'd known each other since they were children. And uh, she got saved as a little girl. And she'd been praying for him to get saved all her life. Well, two days after they get married, Charles accepts an offer to go and preach in a church. So he leaves her for two weeks to go and preach in this church for two weeks. And revival breaks out. And he comes back six months later. So thanks for that, darling. And so he preached differently. Charles preached differently. And, you know, he preached not like a pastor. He preached like a lawyer pleading a case. He never spoke down to people. That was a big issue with the pastors in those days. They spoke at the people, you know, down to them. But he'd say he'd treat them like the jury. I am here to persuade you to accept Christ. This is the facts. This is the evidence. People said it was like being at home. It was like someone in my living room just talking to me. It was just like he was talking to me face to face. He had no desire to impress anyone, no desire to hype anything up. He just wanted people to make a decision for Christ. And that was his goal. And the, the educated theologians criticized him. They criticized his preaching style. And he was rough. He, he didn't take that kind of stuff. They were saying Charles Finney's uneducated. Charles Finney only preaches like this. I mean, he wasn't uneducated. He was remarkably educated. You know, oh, he's this, he's that. He said, you show me a better way and I'll do it. He said, you show me the fruit of your ministry, and if your ministry is more fruitful than mine, and you give me evidence that your way is better than mine, I, I will do it your way. But you cannot seriously expect me to abandon my view and my practice and adopt yours when whatever, however wrong I am, and however imperfect I am, I get results, and you don't. I'm going to improve. I'm going to get better than this. But I'm never going to improve by doing what you do. Man, I like that. I've, I've said that to a few people before, similar words to that. Everybody, when you start in ministry, everybody wants you to wear Saul's armor. And Charles, I'm doing it my way because it works. I know how this thing works. I know this thing goes. For the first 10 years of ministry, Finney never once used notes, ever. He just opened the Bible, picked up a verse, and he preached on that verse, and he used that verse to persuade people to get born again. And he'd always end his messages the same way. They'd always end the same way. I have shown you what the Bible says. I have taught you the gospel. You're in a church, but being in a church is not enough. You need to receive Jesus. You have a choice right now to receive Jesus or reject Jesus. You all know what to do because I taught you. And I expect that if you want to receive Jesus, you will receive him right now. If you want to make a decision for Christ, stand up right now. That's how he ended every service. And then what happened was, sounds like me. Thank you very much, Joe. That's very kind words. To those who did not stand, he turned to them. The people still sing, didn't stand up for Jesus. He'd say, right, you've made a decision. As much as anyone who stood up has made a decision, you've made a decision. You've decided to stay the same way. You have rejected Christ. You have rejected the good news. And you are publicly standing against Jesus Christ. And you are saying, I will not allow Jesus to be my Lord. I feel very sorry for you. And I hope you come tomorrow so I can try and persuade you again. <laughs> and then to those who stood, you would pray with them and say, I'm calling you now to be witnesses for Christ. You're going to eat the good fruit of this decision for the rest of your life. One night, he was speaking. 
and he was speaking to the people who weren't standing like he always did. You know, you've made a choice just as much as people who stood. And as he did, a lady fell right out of a chair onto the ground. So Charles thought, oh, she must be sick. So he came over to check on her. And as he came over, he felt the presence of God all over her. And he realized God had basically knocked her out of the chair. And the woman lay on the ground. She couldn't speak at all. She just lay there, frozen, couldn't speak. Well, she lay there, unable to talk, frozen for 16 hours. And then now in the next day, in the morning meeting, and she stands up in the middle of the meeting and said, I thought I was saved by my works. But now I see I need the righteousness of Christ. I've accepted Jesus as my righteousness, and my salvation is now complete. And as she said, people said, we're not waiting for you to finish. And they got up in the middle of the meeting, started standing up and said, I want to re receive Jesus right now. One night, a woman got healed of tuberculosis. A woman got saved. And uh, this woman who got saved and healed of tuberculosis, she was a, a, a universalist. That was a big issue in the church back then. And so you have these two crazy options. One is that God doesn't want anyone to get saved, apart from a very few elect. And one that everyone's already saved, no matter what you do. That's universalism. You see, it's important why we study church history. Because you start to realize these problems come around in cycles. And, you know, when... Um, Universalism came around again. And there's grace teachers out there, grace teachers teaching universalism right now. They're teaching that everyone's born, born again. And uh, I spotted it immediately. I spotted the error. I spotted the heresy immediately, uh, a lot earlier than some of my contemporaries. Why? Because I've studied these guys and I've read these guys and I know it, it comes around. It always comes around. And so this woman's husband was a minister and they had a church where they taught that everyone was saved. Everyone was a Christian, everybody, even the Baptists. There's no hell. And anyway, so she goes home and she's healed of tuberculosis. And, but she's also, more importantly, delivered of universalism. And she's now a Christian. She's now born again. She's disciple of Jesus. So she goes home and tells her husband. Her husband, the pastor, the universalist pastor, is so annoyed at Charles Finney that he turns up the next night at the church with a gun. And he's going to get, wait till Finney gives the altar call, come forward and shoot him. That's what he's going to do. And so in the middle of the sermon, while, the, while Finney's preaching, in the middle of the sermon, the man falls out of his chair onto his face and starts sobbing. I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to go to hell. Now, remember, he's a universalist. He doesn't believe in hell. And after the meeting, he's just lying there. Finney said, just leave him there. And he spent the whole service lying on his face, sobbing that he's going to go to hell. At the end of the meeting, he said, well, pick him up and take him home. So they picked him up. He, they, he couldn't move on his own. They just carried him home and put him in his bed. The next morning, Charles is walking to the church. He's walking along the road to church. And um, as he's walking along the road, the man's on the street opposite him. The man charges at him, grabs him, hugs him, picks him right off the ground and spins him around. And he says, I got born again. I've got peace with God. Man alive. And so those manifestations happened a lot in Finney's meeting. People fell down. People hit the power of God. People would fall to their knees crying in the middle of his sermons. He met a man called Father Nash. He was a, he was a minister. And uh, the father wasn't like because he was Catholic or anything. It was just He was an old man. They just affectionately called him Father. And they worked together. He came to one of Finney's meetings. And they worked together. When Finney first met him, he was uh, kind of backslidden. He wasn't really living for God. And he had a really bad eye disease. And he couldn't go out in the daytime because his eyes were so poor. He couldn't get bright lights around him. And so he just sat in his room all day praying and eventually prayed himself healthy, prayed right through, got the eye disease healed. And he started praying for other people. He just loved praying after that time. And um, he started praying for other people. So Charles would give him a list of things to pray for. And as Nash prayed, Charles said, anything you gave that guy on, put on, on the list for him to pray for, we got. It happened. So Nash finds out there's a bar in town where the owner is actually beating up Christians. And um, he puts his name on the prayer list, the owner of this bar, under his special list of hard people to get saved. And um, he's spreading lies about the churches and spreading lies about Christians. And uh, his bar is the most wild bar in town. And so Nash was with Charles. He said, let's pray together for these meetings. They pray together, and they pray for the bar owner together in the afternoon. Well, in the evening, the bar owner turns up at church. But he hasn't turned up to get saved. He's turned up to cause trouble. And people are nervous. This guy's come in. He's a bit of a hard nut. And, you know, he's come in, but he doesn't cause trouble. He sits down, and he's just shaking in his chair the whole time. Finally, halfway through the sermon, he stands up. He says, I demand to have my voice heard right now. And Charles says, go ahead. And so the guy comes to the front, 
And I don't know what he was going to say, what he intended to say. When he gets to the front, he starts sobbing. And he says, I'm a bad person. I've done this wrong. He starts telling everyone all the stuff he's done wrong in his life. He says, I need Jesus in my life. He falls to his knees and gets born again. Well, the whole place is just so moved. Finney gets up and says, you want to get Jesus in your life too. You stand up and people get saved. Well, the man goes back to the bar and closes it down. He turns it into to a shelter. Um, for homeless Christians, and they start to come in. He starts looking after them and feeding them, and he holds prayer meetings every night, and Finney starts going there and starts preaching. I mean, the, it just changed people's lives. Charles' favorite thing to do was find somewhere in America, these new towns, these sort of frontier towns, where there was no church, and go and preach to lost sheep and people who didn't have a church, and they had a plan. Nash would go into town about a month before Charles, and he would pray. And he would let people know Charles was coming. He would get the halls hired, speak to the pastors, start some prayer meeting. His prayer meetings were never more than three or four people, but he'd find a couple of them in the town to pray with. And um, they went to one town called Governor, which was just outside New York, and it was going fine. People were getting saved every day. And so another church came, a Calvinist church, came to protest Finney's meetings. You know, stand outside and try and stop people getting in. And uh, they were trying to stop people going to the church. They were actually being physically aggressive to the other Christians who were going to church. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? You go to another church and, you know, physically. I I've experienced that. I've experienced that um, uh, when I went to Andrew Womack in Plymouth. There were people outside there protesting, trying to stop us getting Christians. Oh, yeah, Christians. And uh, I saw it when I went to um, Bournemouth to hear Kenneth Copeland. There were people out there with placards. You know, Kenneth Copeland doesn't believe in the blood of Jesus. I mean, you'd have to close your ears every time he spoke to think that you'd have to be absolutely stupid um but people think you know i'm, I'm called to protest other churches and stuff no you're not you're called to leave well alone go and do what you're doing but they protested finney's meetings and um, they said charles what are you gonna do so i'm off to go and pray i need to pray so he went and found a forest he liked his forest and he prayed and he went and walked around the forest and prayed and uh, so sunday night he said god's promised me everything will be fine so they had a whole bunch of services on sunday one after the other because there were so many people coming and at 5 p.m., they had a prayer meeting for the evening meeting. Well, in the evening, the place was absolutely packed out. This church was absolutely packed, standing room only. And um, the young men came in. They came in to fight people and disrupt the meeting. Well, Finney said, God told me it'd be okay. And as soon as Finney said that, the Spirit of God just filled the whole room. And there was a real sense of solemnness, a real sense of just awe. And um, those men suddenly felt very out of place in this beautiful or filled presence of god and so nash gets up and says I I I i'll preach and he says you are coming against the spirit of god and if you don't get converted god's going to kill you all and then nash falls to his knees and starts praying for them well the, the men don't know where to go now finney's really concerned he goes nash is, you know that was a bit too far you know repent or god's going to kill you um you know you can't threaten people with death to get them saved and so charles gets up and preached the gospel most of the young men get born again um, and then Finney corrects Nash. He says, Nash, you went too far there. And Nash says, yeah, you did. And so Nash went to find some of the young men had left the building. So Nash goes and finds them. He finds them all. And the ones that left and didn't get saved, Nash then, as he apologizes to them, he then leads them all to the Lord and they get saved as well. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? For seven years, Nash prayed with Charles every day. And he prayed in every meeting Charles did. They prayed together daily for seven years. Nash prayed loud. People could hear Nash pray um, over half a um, mile away. People could hear him pray over half a mile away. So from 1825 to 1827, Charles went to all the different parts of New York, like the state of New York, all the different towns and villages, speaking in these frontier towns, speaking in community halls, speaking in the like. Again, people thought New York was the hardest place, and that's where Finney started his ministry. Okay. Hey, Amanda's here. Good to see you, Amanda. Beautiful stuff. Thank you, darling. And, uh, well, I didn't do the stuff. I'm just telling the story. Finney did the stuff. Thank you, Charles Finney. And um, he preached in Pennsylvania in 1827. He spent most of the, the year in Pennsylvania in 1827. In 1828, his first child was born, Helen. Uh, he then started preaching in Philadelphia. He came back home and uh, preached in New York again, 1829, 1830, all around New York. But now his meetings are getting bigger. We're talking about thousands of people are coming to these meetings. And the newspapers are starting to notice and what's happening is as, as he's preaching, not only is the meetings getting bigger because more people are coming, but there's more people in the towns. The towns are all growing. People are coming from, you know, all over Europe to, to help build this new frontier, this new America. Workers are moving uh, across the different areas. And when they move, they want churches. And um, they're looking for peace, aren't they? They're looking for something that's stable when there's so many changes. They're moving to new 
towns, new continents, new places. And uh, Finney's right there preaching the gospel, and the crowds kept growing and growing. A lot of the other ministers, a lot of the other ministers did not like Charles Finney. Again, when you're successful, this envy comes in. They called him unrefined. They called him barbaric. They said he was manipulating the people. They didn't like his new measures. Finney, like I said, was very well read. And uh, he read Wesley, read a lot of Wesley, liked reading Wesley. Okay. And um, so he started reading Wesley. And uh, what happened was, was uh, Wesley had something that the Methodists didn't do anymore, but when Wesley was around, they did, and it was called the anxious seats, okay? Called the anxious seats, okay? And so the anxious seats were a set of seats at the front of the building. So Wesley would have the front row reserved for the anxious people. So if you're in the meeting and you suddenly feel anxious, uh, I don't know whether I'm going to heaven or hell. I, I don't know if God loves me. I don't know if I'm going to get through this. You would come and sit on the front row, and then what would happen is someone would know because you're sitting on the anxious seats. You know, number one, the preacher would know his preaching is on track because people are moving to the anxious seats. And number two, he knows these are the people I need to pray for. These are the people I need to really minister to. Um, Finney was also very pro. And again, this doesn't fit. If any of you know Calvinist churches, you know this doesn't happen in Calvinist churches. Women don't minister in Calvinist churches. And so across the board, women didn't minister in America then. And Finney said, no, women should pray aloud. Women should you know, pray out loud. And the Calvinist churches really did not like that. They did not like the fact that he would let women pray out loud. It's not approved for a woman to pray. He was criticized for using common speech. He even used slang words in his sermons. One pastor says his problem is that he preaches to the common man in their language because he's more concerned with winning souls to Jesus than doing things the way they've always been done. No, this pastor meant it as an insult, but it was a compliment, wasn't it? A pastor in Boston said, if you come to my town, I will shoot you. I'm going to get a gun. I'm going to shoot you in the head. That's a nice pastor there. Okay. And we, we've had trouble from other pastors. We've never had someone threaten to shoot me in the head. Um, I don't think I've had someone threaten to beat me up, actually. I don't think I have. Not a pastor. We've certainly had them threaten to expose me and write blog posts about me and tell everyone what I'm really like. Um but the newspapers heard about this pastor telling everyone he's going to shoot Finney. And uh, so they said Finney's terrible. And they, they started bad-mouthing Finney. And uh, they said he's a lawyer who comes in and attacks the congregation. And he said, I'm not a lawyer who attacks the congregation. I'm an evangelist who cares for people and wants people to be born again. They said, you're self-promoting. You're over-emotional. You're running the meetings too long. Your prayers are irreverent. And your language is coarse. Don't you know? Your coarse language. Awesome. Corwin's just said, I've known about Finney most of my life, but never wanted to know about him. Uh, you made me want to know more. I'm going to read the stuff I have about him. Thank you. Well, that's part of the reason of these things, isn't it? I can't encapsulate anyone's life in an hour, near an hour and a half, most of these, actually. You know, I can't encapsulate someone's life, but it like, drives you to go and read some more, study some more, you know, get some more information. Then I'm glad I've done my job. So look at this as an introductory uh, to, to Finney. Praise God. Thank you for that, Corwin. That's really beautiful. In 1826, in 1826, he was asked to speak at a cotton mill. His brother-in-law was the manager of the cotton mill, and um, he was asked to speak um, there. So Finney comes into the cotton mill, and there's a young girl trying to thread a needle. And as she's threading the needle and can't do it, she blasphemes, okay? And Finney just looks at her, and she looks at him and she just starts to cry and cry and cry. She falls off her chair and starts sobbing. And suddenly people in the room are crying. People on other floors of the factory aren't even in the room, don't even know what's happening, start crying. Nobody knows why. People start crying. People start calling out to God for mercy. Well, the owner of the factory happened to be there that day. And he says, we need to deal with this. So he shuts the whole factory down gathers everybody, and he says, I'm paying you now to listen to this preacher preach about Jesus. And for four days, Finney preached to thousands of mill workers about Jesus. They were paid on the clock. He preached them for four days, and every single one of them in those four days got born again. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. Man, the local minister in that town where the, 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 the cotton mill was, he said, I got 3,000 new people in my church after Finney came. And after eight months, every one of them was still in my church. And they were the best servants and the best helpers and the best Christians in the church. Isn't that awesome? Meanwhile, 
that other churches in town started making effigies of Finney. They started making, you know, Guy Fawkes Finneys and hanging them on trees, and then they'd get guns and they'd shoot Finney on the tree. What? They'd do what? That's what they did. And they, they, they would then lie to the newspapers and tell all these lies about Finney, and the newspapers would print the lies. So he went through some remarkable persecution just for preaching the gospel. Okay? And then if, you, if you'd gone to Finney back then, because people did, and you go, look, do you know what they're saying about you in the newspaper? He said, well, of course they say lies in the newspaper. The world hates the truth because the world doesn't want to be saved. But nothing the newspaper says is going to stop the work of God. Revival. Listen to me very carefully, because this really, I think, is Finney's greatest contribution to the whole, the whole church as a whole right now. And, and some people have grasped it and some people haven't. And I believe most of your tree of life have grasped it. Chris has just said his son's really enjoying it. That's awesome. Uh, father and son watching this together. That just really honors me, Chris. It really does. Hi, Joel. Good to see you. Thanks for watching. It's Finney said this, and you've got to understand this because there's still people in the church don't understand this. Revival is not a sovereign move of God. Let me say that again. Revival is not a sovereign move of God. One of the things that Finney taught that I read as a new Christian when I got born again that really helped me was this. Revival is not a sovereign move of God. And I was in Scotland. Scotland is far more Calvinistic than England, okay? And so if you if you don't know Scotland, you haven't lived in Scotland, you don't realize how religious it is, how small-minded it is. Um, some of you may have heard of Rabbi Burns, the Scottish poet. Rabbi Burns went to church as a young boy, was made to go to church, and he was pushed about getting saved. Said, you know, you need to think about following God, you need to think about being a Christian. And he says, I cannot follow God because God is a monster. And they said, what do you mean that God is a monster? And he says, God has no regard for anyone. God will send one person to heaven and one person to hell, and there'll be no regard to their person at all. It's just him deciding. That is a monster. I reject Christianity. But he wasn't rejecting Christianity. He was rejecting Presbyterianism. So the, the national church in Scotland is the, the Presbyterian church, the Calvinist church. Okay? And so, you know... That's what it was. So I grew up in that. And the Baptists are Calvinist churches in Scotland, not, not the same way they are in England. There's a much more stronger religious element in Scotland. There's a lot more Calvinistic. And so we were taught in our churches, revival is a sovereign move of God. And if God wants to send revival, he will just jolly well send revival. And if he doesn't, he just wants us to be stinking and wants us not to get people saved and wants us to be a persecuted minority and wants us to be in trouble and tough. That's just what God wants. And you just have to endure, endure that. And Finney said, that's not right. Finney said, that's not how it happened. Finney said, we can preach and teach the word in such a way that we can change people's hearts. And if we can change people's hearts, we can change a community. And if we can change a community, we can change a town. We can change a city. We can change a nation. We can do things. We can go and pray God's promises and God's word. And we can stand on those promises and believe those promises and expect God to answer our prayer. We can expect God to be faithful to his word. And if we do the word... And believe the word god will always back up his word god is always faithful to his word and i'll tell you as a young christian getting that inside me helped me so much helped set me free from what was around me and the environment around me this calvinistic nonsense that god's going to do whatever god's going to do right the places in the world that have seen great revivals are the places where people believed there would be a great revival where people declared it. People went out and went and made disciples of the nations. This is so important. I believe that this truth is Finney's greatest legacy to our generation. And we need to accept that. I really believe that. Someone said of Finney this, whenever he preached, he expected God would meet people when he preached. He expected the Holy Spirit to move. He saw his only job was to point at the lamb and get out of the way. He lived in an atmosphere that the rest of us called revival, but that's where he lived. Expectation and faith, expectation and faith. You, you, you have to go to pray to get the expectation. And then when you get the expectation, you get the faith, you need to release it in prayer. And then you go and do something. What do you do? You do what the book of Acts says. You seek to persuade people. You have to persuade people. And so Finney's ministry, because of this, is now growing. Because nobody else is saying this. 
1830, their second son is born, Charles Jr. And um, September 1830 was a massive turning point for Finney. He was due to speak in Rochester in New York. Rochester was the fastest growing town for the last 10 years. In 1811, Rochester was 15 people. In 1823, it was over 2,000. They built an aqueduct connecting all the farms around Rochester, and so it became the market town. By 1830, there was 10,000 people living there, and anybody could go and get there because of the, the infrastructure was so good. Finney was in Rochester for three months, preached every night for three months, and 100,000 people got born again in three months. 100,000 people. Some people were traveling over 100 miles to hear him preach. One of his greatest critics turned up and said, I've changed my mind. This is the greatest move of God I've ever seen in my life. I've changed my mind about this man. This man's a man of God. And what happened was one of the things that marks Charles Finney's ministry is when people got saved, when Finney preached, they went to church and they were part of the church and they started serving in the church. And it was amazing, just remarkable. The amount of people who stayed and grew became fruitful Christians. 85% of people born again in Charles Finney's ministry, 85% were still serving God in local church 10 years later. That is unparalleled, absolutely unparalleled. No one else has done that in history. So the whole town of Rochester is now born again virtually. I mean, honestly, the whole town is completely, everyone in the town is now Christian. Do you believe that can happen today in your town? Do you believe that can happen in the UK today? Do you believe that can happen where you're watching from today? Do you believe that could be one of our things today? And what happened was Charles had only been asked to go and preach in one of the small churches in town. It was the smallest church in town. And the pastor there was quite a good pastor. And they'd put him in a bigger church in the same town. And so there was no one there. And they needed a pastor for a few weeks. And one of the elders was a businessman. And he was a very successful businessman. He ran a stagecoach service in the U.S., and uh, he was famous because he wouldn't run his stagecoach on a Sunday because he was born again, didn't believe he should do that. And he was very generous to the church, gave a lot of money to the church. And Charles wasn't really keen to go to Rochester because all the churches in Rochester were fighting and he didn't want to be part of it. They were fighting over money. They were fighting over the way to do church. They were fighting over Sunday shopping. And then what happened was one of the ministers had gotten a stagecoach owned by another guy, not the guy who was helping the church. He used a rival stagecoach company, you know, and this guy then said, right, I'll give to every church in the town except for your church. And he started giving money to every church in the town apart from that pastor's church. And people were fighting and people were leaving churches because of this and people were getting upset because of it. And uh, it was just a nasty environment. And so Charles wasn't keen. But he went to pray about it, went to his little gl glade, and he went to pray about it. And God spoke to him, and he said, to not go because they need someone to go is stupid. Never avoid a field because it needs work, but go where you needed the most. That's what God spoke to him. I tell you, there's some revelation there. You know, I just want to let, let you all know in the UK, by the way, and I love, you know, there's some Americans watching right now, and I love America, and I, I, you know, I go to America two or three times every year. I love my American friends, but I tell you what, you won't see me part of the spiritual brain drain moving to America. Like, you know, any UK pastor who's got a bit of anointing to him ends up going to America because it's easier to get a church and easier to minister. I'm staying here because this is where I'm needed and this is where I'm going to be. And we're going to change the UK and we're going to change these nations and we're going to build mega churches in the UK, all over the UK, thousands of people. And we're going to do it. And we're going to impact a million people in the name of Jesus, because I'm not going to go where it's convenient. I'm not going to go and ignore a field just because it needs work. I'm here for the UK. Chalable course under the day. That wasn't in my notes. That just came right out of my heart right now. The UK will be saved. We will see this nation changed. Go where you needed the most. And so when God spoke that to him, he says, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm determined to go. So he turns up and he says, right, I'm preaching seven times this week. I want to preach four evenings, take an evening off. I want to preach three times on Sunday. Well, the newly promoted pastor, he comes to the meetings to see what they're like because it's still his old church. And he sneaks in. He's like, man, this guy's great. 
So when Finney realizes he's there and he realizes that the stagecoach guy's there, Finney gets up and he starts preaching on the fact we've got to have good relationships and we need to be unity. And the two of them, well, they buried the hatchet and they repented and, and Finney prayed for them both. And man, the whole church is now talking. Everyone's talking and people started coming to the meetings. The old came, the young came, the rich came, the poor came, the rural people came, the urban people came. Businesses started to close down so their employees could go to the meetings. The women from the church started a door-to-door -door prayer ministry. They just started knocking on everyone's doors. Do you need prayer? Can we pray for you? Every bar in town had to close because no one was going to the bars. No one was going out. They just came to the church. Crime rates dropped to nothing, and they stayed that way in Rochester for years. The teenagers couldn't pay attention in class. They were all too busy talking about Jesus. They loved Jesus so much. So the school director called Finney in, canceled school for a week, and Finney just preached to the students every day for a week. Rochester was saved. You couldn't walk across the town without hearing the gospel preached, without hearing someone singing praise hymns. You couldn't go to the shops without someone sharing Christ with you. And people just stopped what they're doing in the middle of the shop and just start praising God. The whole community just loved Jesus. Everyone was talking about Jesus. The only theater in town was sold and became a, a stable. The only circus in town was sold, became a factory to make soap. The churches were packed. All the off licenses were closed. I forgot what word they used for them, but I had to get it translated because I didn't know what it was, but it's basically an offie. And um, the charitable giving, man, the giving that came in, people were just nice to each other. There was just a goodness to it. Now, in the meetings, that nobody went to the anxiety bench. They just stopped the meeting in the middle of the meeting, stand up and say, I want to get saved now. Stop the meeting. Stop preaching. I want to get saved now. And so one service, Charles doesn't even preach. He just gets up the front. He says, right, anyone who's get saved, just come right now. Come forward. And they just came forward to get saved. It, that may have been, that may honestly have been the very first altar call ever. Just get up and come to the front if you want to get saved. Okay? And they just came forward. Corwin saying package store. That might have been it. I'm not sure. And so they, they all came forward and got said the very first altar call. And he said, you're going to come forward publicly because you're going to say, I'm not the same anymore. You're going to get out. Everyone's going to see you come forward because you're going to publicly say, I need forgiveness. I need to receive Jesus, and I'm going to do it in public. Those meetings in Rochester changed all of America. And as people started hearing of them, as people started coming to them and going back to their towns and preaching the same gospel Finney did, it led to what was called the Second Great Awakening. America caught fire for Jesus. Evangelists from all over America came, and then suddenly they said, as soon as we came and went, we went out, and suddenly our meetings were much bigger. Presbyterians came, Methodists came, Episcopalians, Congregationals, Baptists, they were all there. And what happened was the meetings were so big, so many people got saved that the persecution just stopped because there was nobody around persecuting. Nobody wanted to speak against it because it was so large. By the end of 19, 1831, by the end of 1831, Rochester was being spoken about across the whole of America. People started going to church every day. People started going to prayer meetings. Church became the community center. People went to work, praising God, working hard, making more money. People were prospering like never before. People would pass around transcripts of Charles' sermons, and they'd just say, "Why? Well, when, when he come to our town? And people just go and read them. All over America, things started to change. One town in particular, I can't remember the name of the town, sorry, but it was a dead town. There was one church, and it was about to close. There's nobody's going to church. There was a blacksmith in the town, and he stuttered. He had such a bad speech impediment they couldn't actually speak to you. You couldn't understand what he was saying. His speech was so bad. Well, he heard about what was happening. And he got one of Finney's sermons. And one afternoon, he was just overwhelmed with a desire to pray. So he shut down his shop for the day, went inside to his uh, blacksmith's place. And he got down on his knees and he said, Lord, you've got to send a preacher to come to this town. He started praying all afternoon for God to send a preacher the next Sunday, he just went to the church to see what would happen if God's going to answer his prayer. And loads of people just came to the church. And there was no preacher. The church was about to close. There was no one there. And so this blacksmith got up. He was healed of his speech impediment. And he preached the gospel. And hundreds of people got born again that Sunday. And he became the pastor of the church. Shortly after that, Finney felt God say, it's now time for you to pastor. And, you know, Leading that revival, preaching dozens of times a week was hard. And Finney got TB, got tuberculosis. And the doctor said, you have to rest. You're going to die. He said, I'm not going to die. I'm just working too hard. I'm just going to have a little rest. And so he, he went to a small church in a town called Auburn. So this will be a rest. Um, I'll just do six weeks there, just a few meetings. Well, revival broke out. 
People said, we've never had anyone preach like this. He's got authority. He's got life. People were changing. People's lives were changing. Other churches came along. The town was changed forever. He traveled to Buffalo in New York. He went to Rhode Island, Boston. People loved him. Even by then, the critics loved him, really. You know, the grace of God will make even your worst enemy start to love you. In 1832, their third child was born, Fred, uh, Frederick, Fred. And by the when that happened, Charles thought, right, really, I, I do need to stop traveling now. I've got, you know, I've got three children now, and so I'm going to take them to church. We took them to church in, right in New York City, right in the center of New York. And one was a number of wealthy businessmen bought a theater, and they got the whole thing renovated and made it a church. And it seated over 2,000 people, and it was packed every Sunday. And he preached every evening for 70 nights. He wouldn't let anyone come from another church. You couldn't join me from another church. Those seats are for the lost. They're not for you to come because you're curious because you chose the wrong church. He was strong. He taught his church members, you sit all over the building and you actively look for new people. You, you see someone who's impacted, you go and find them. You take them out for lunch after church and you spend time with them. You, you don't get scared of new people. You believe the best for them and you love them and you go and minister to them. And he told all these people to go out there and reach the people in the church. And when he pastored, he pastored like an evangelist. He was out for the people. And so he built special rooms in this church that if you want to get saved after church, you won't come in with an altcorn now. It wasn't an anxious seat. You just go to this room and at the end of the room, the, the, the people in the church would go in that room and uh, his church members would go in the room and they'd teach, talk to them, teach them and get them born again one at a time. And um, they filled the, those rooms that they had to then use them as an overflow room. So we then had to buy another building across town and, and start a second church just of the overflow. In the summer, uh, that summer, very interesting considering what happened. You know, we're going through a lockdown. But in summer, cholera broke out that summer, uh, summer of 31, 1831. And uh, so a lot of people left New York City because the cholera was there. They didn't want to get cholera. And um, Finney stayed. He said, I'm not leaving, and, I, and I'm not staying in my house. I'm not staying in my house. I'm going to go out. I'm going to keep having services, and uh, Finney caught cholera. Uh, by September that year, he caught cholera, probably at a church meeting. He survived, but the side effect of the medicine that he took, combined with the fact he had uh, TB, had consumption, he couldn't preach for six months. He was so weak, and even a year later, he was still very, very weak. So they decided, let's send him on a cruise and have a rest. So he went on a cruise to Sicily and he rested. On the way back from Sicily, he's quite concerned. He thinks America is going to fall away from God, that this revival is going to be short lived. He's got a real concern. He felt that people would rise up and start persecuting Christians in the nation. And he felt the Christians would just let them. You know, he, he felt that Christians were far too nice when people were coming at them. He felt we should, we should push back, you know, in love and in kindness, we should push back. And he still felt very weak and very sick. And he felt there was no other evangelist in the land that could take his place yet. And those thoughts really hurt him. He was very concerned about the nation of America. He loved his nation. And in fact, they, 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 they overwhelmed him to the point where he felt crushed. And he felt, who could I talk to? Who could he talk to? You know, who's my peer? Who can I have a conversation with this about? So he, he said, well, I'll talk to the Lord. I'll pray. And he asked the Lord for wisdom. He said, Lord, I want two things. I want to help more people than I've ever helped. And I want to pass the baton on to the next generation. And as he prayed those prayers and asked those two things, the Spirit of God filled his room. And he says, I've got a work for you to do that will change many lives. And then I'll give you other people you can teach. And then you can rest. And I, I can work with other people. And I'll give you the strength to do what I've called you to do. And he just got so excited. No one's coming next. got so excited. So Finney gets back to New York. And what happens is it's almost like as he lands in New York, his eyes are suddenly open to the fact that he lives in a country where slavery is happening, where slavery is accepted. Okay. Now that they started, the churches had got together and started the New York Anti-Slavery Society, which eventually became the American Anti-Slavery Society. Now Charles was was always anti-slavery. Honestly, he always let black people into his meetings, and at first they had a separate section; they were segregated. Then he ended that. And that was radical for the day. I mean, just having them in the same building was radical for the day. I mean, really was. And then he ended the segregation when he came back from that trip. He really felt it was over. And then he refused to give communion to slave owners. If you're a slave owner, you are not having communion at my church. You can go to another church, but I'm not giving communion to anyone who owns another person's property. His church was actually set on fire twice by companies that use slaves because he started preaching against slavery. And they burned the whole roof off the church. He had to preach without a roof. 
Um, but he redesigned the roof and the same wealthy businessman and other businessmen turned up and he actually got a better roof and the whole building looked better. But for now, this whole issue of slavery really was heavy on Charles's heart. And he went to pray about it. Lord, give me an opening. And so as he was praying, a local newspaper asked him, will you write some sermons on revival that we can print in the newspaper? So he started off, he was very clever, started off writing some articles on revival, just the usual teaching, the usual teaching. Revival is not a miracle. Revival is not a sovereign move of God. Revival is a response to you seeking God, you trusting God's promises, you believe in God. And, um, you know, he wrote these articles to refute the ideas of Calvinism. Uh, most of those articles in the newspaper became the book. You, you probably may have read it or heard of it. It's called Lectures on Revival. They came from those newspaper articles. Um, that book is a remarkable book. Um, I don't agree with all of it. There, there, there's some of it which is very, very much about look inside yourself, find your sin, repent of your sin. And, you know, Chris, um, Chris this morning during the worship summed up perfectly what I believe. You know, we need to be sun aware, not sin aware. And we need to look to the sun, not look to the sin. But, you know, Finney was just saying it's what we do. It's where we look and we need to get rid of these sins. And, you know, I, I understand where it's coming from. So some of it might be a bit heavy. But as a book, uh, you know, it's got some great teachings and some great scriptural ideas about how we can start changing our nation. And, um, you know, and what he basically said was, what Finney said was, and he did say this, he said, if you want to change a nation, a city, a community, it's all about sowing seeds. And if you sow the right seeds, you'll always get the right harvest because god's always faithful to the seed and uh, if you sow the right seed if you sow the word of god into people's hearts and you pray the word of god you'll always have a revival because you'll always have a harvest and so but then what he started doing was he then started writing more and more anti-slavery stuff and it was now in the newspaper and everyone's reading it because it was finny it was in the newspapers so the whole nation is now reading him biblically argue against slavery um there was an 1890s textbook that was used for school children that basically said, who has, who is the most important figure in ending slavery in America? And um, you got some marks for saying Abraham Lincoln. You got some marks for saying Andrew Carnegie. But the highest mark was for saying it was Charles Finney. That's what the people believed. That one generation after the American Civil War, people believed that Charles Finney's teaching and his making it socially unacceptable was what turned the tide so that America, I mean, they had to have a civil war for this thing, but America could end slavery uh, in a generation. Absolutely remarkable. And so that was the first bit. God gave him a way to help people, and that's what he wanted. The second bit was, how can I help? Well, because people are reading the newspaper, and they're reading these lectures across the whole thing, young men are turning up. Everywhere Finney goes to preach, in 34 and 35, there's young men coming and saying, I want to be an evangelist like you. I want to do what you do. And there were so many. He said, right, I'm going to hold a series of lectures for young men who want to be evangelists and basically started a school of evangelists. And uh, as he started, as he was making plans to start, there was a Bible college in New York that was having issues. And what the issue was, was a number of the students, mainly because they were reading Finney in the newspaper every day, um, felt that owning slaves was sinful and that we should not give communion to slave owners because he doesn't. And the college was trying to silence those students and say, no, 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 slavery is fine. And there was a lot of friction. Well, the students and one of the professors said, we're all leaving. And all the students quit the Bible college. And this one professor quit. And they started a new Bible college. And uh, the professor said, well, I can't teach you alone. We need to build a new faculty. Who do you want? And all the students said the same answer. We want Finney. So they, they approached Finney and said, would you be a professor in this Bible school? So he said, as long as I can teach evangelism and as long as I can bring these young men with me. And he did. He said... But there are other conditions. The other conditions were, number one, that African-Americans and women would be treated exactly the same as the white men. men. There'd be no discrimination, no segregation, same classrooms, same assignments, same rooms. You could sit anywhere you like, no segregation, nothing like that. Not male, female, and not African-American and white. That, wouldn't, that would never happen. And they agreed. And that college, that college actually became part of the Underground Railroad, which was helping slaves escape the South and get to Canada where they could be free. There were never many black students, it was about 4 or 5%, but there were some, and they knew that they were free there. It was the first university in New York ever to have a women's department, because so many women came and trained to be evangelists. By 1840, they had 500 students. By 1850, they had over 1,000 students. 1862, Mary Jane Patterson, whose parents were both slaves, she was the first African-American woman in the U.S. to ever get a degree. And it was Finney was her professor, and Finney marked her degree. She went on to become a high school teacher and then became a high school principal. 
Finney taught the students every morning to focus on the Lord. And he taught the evangelist. He said, you've got to expect the Holy Spirit to be there. You've got to expect the Holy Spirit to work in people's lives when you speak. Whenever you get up and speak, you've got to remember this. The Holy Spirit wants to change the life of everyone in that room for the better. Never forget that. In 1836, the Congregational Church in town needed a new pastor. So Finney took that role on as well. So he's now teaching in the Bible school and he is um, pastoring. So he, he stepped back from his church in New York. He stepped back from the Presbyterians, became a congregational pastor. Fourth child was born that year as well, Julia. So Charles would just preach on the Sunday in the church. He wouldn't really do much active pastoring. He'd preach on the Sunday. And um, what he did, though, is he used that church as a real help to evangelize. And that church grew, and that church entered into another 2,000-seater building. And that building was actually the largest church building in New York for over 100 years. It took 100 years for someone to have a bigger church than Finney had in New York. His success in helping slaves find freedom and change attitudes about slavery made Finney say, well, we can touch other peoples. We can touch the rest of society. So he spoke about um, not getting drunk. And he talked about not getting drunk. He campaigned to stop the Sunday shopping, uh, to allow women to have every single role in the church. Um, but he never stopped putting the main thing as winning Jesus, uh, as winning people to Jesus. That was the main thing, winning people to Jesus. He told the students this. Listen to this. I love this. If you put winning people to Jesus first, you will change the world. If you put changing the world first, you will lose your way. That's really deep. In 1842, he did another preaching circuit of New York, the whole state, and revival broke out everywhere. And what happened was he met people. This is the first time it happened to him in 1842. He met people who'd come back to the Lord. But they got saved when he preached five years ago, ten years ago. Um, but they weren't walking with God. And now they'd come back to the Lord. And that really bothered him. He said, right, we need to start preaching and getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. And it wasn't clear really what he taught in that area. What you got when you got baptized in the Holy Ghost. He didn't preach on tongues. He certainly spoke in tongues. But it was sort of a power to witness, a power to be holy, similar to Wesley. But seeing these people set Charles to start praying on preaching on getting the power of the Holy Spirit. In 1843, he goes to Boston and he finds that some of the people who got saved in his meetings are now universalists. And Finney hated universalism. He said, those people just deny everything. They just deny everything. And um, they're irrational. And they, they, they managed, he says, I've never met a group of people who managed to interpret every single scripture wrong. And universalists, by the way, if you don't know, they believe that everyone's going to heaven, no matter what you do. All religions are the same. They've all got the same equal merit. And you can interpret the Bible however you want. And again, these things are cyclical. They happen again and again, you know, and they're happening today. It's the same lies over and over. And so Finney got up at 4 a.m. every day in Boston, prayed for four hours, got up and taught the truths to words, especially dealing with universalism. And he started dealing with some of these errors in the church. And so near the end of his life, he really started becoming a Bible teacher as well as an evangelist to deal with some of these errors, to really help disciple people. Now, back home, Lydia's getting weaker. She's not well. She's had her fifth child. And um, their fifth child passed away very shortly after she was born. And then they had their sixth child shortly afterwards. Um, so the fifth child was called Sarah. And she, 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 she died before her first birthday. And then the final charge was called Delia. Now, now Lydia, his wife, was remarkable. A remarkable contribu con contributor, contributor to the ministry. You know, she was mothering those children. Charles was hardly ever home. She, en she was not a person who enjoy en enjoyed fame. But she put up with the fact that her husband was famous. She hated the spotlight, but she prayed. She was a woman who prayed and got results. People knew that. On her deathbed, she got all the children together and prayed for them all. And then she told her husband, her last words were she sat down with her husband, she laid down on the deathbed, she said, my work is done. And then she just passed on. That was 1847 she died. When she died, Charles fell apart. He couldn't move. He couldn't do anything. His eldest child at the time when she died was 19. The youngest was three. And he was, at the time, he was teaching at Bible school. He was a um, full-time evangelist and doing a lot more besides writing for the newspapers every day. Um, now, there was a widow. And this widow and her husband had been supporting Charles for two decades financially. And so she came and started helping with the children, and they decided to get married. And it, it, it seems to me, and again, it's hard to tell from what you read, it seems to me that was sort of a more con marriage of convenience rather than the, the, the love he had 
with Lydia. But they, they, they did, uh, Elizabeth was her name, and they got married, and they helped each other a lot. Um, they traveled to Great Britain in 49. Um, Charles had some amazing ministry in the UK, really successful ministry in the UK. In 1851, Charles became the president of the college that he was teaching at, and he kept doing these crusades. Between 1851 and 57, he really focused on New York and really was, you know, the, the state of New York. In 1859, he made his second trip to the UK, his last trip to the UK, he went to Scotland for the first time. And that trip, that trip really wore him out. He returned to the US, 1860, and he said, I'm not traveling again. I'm, I'm exhausted. Now, 1860 is when civil war broke out in America. 1863, Elizabeth passes away. And in 1864, Charles marries a third time to Rebecca. She's one of his staff at the Bible school. Charles resigned as president. He felt like he couldn't keep that pace on. He, he just felt unwell. He kept lecturing. And so for 11 years, he never traveled in evangelistic means again. All he did was lecture at the Bible school and pass the baton on to the next generation. And I think that's wise. I think there comes a stage in your life where you've got to stop doing what you do and start investing in others. They can do what you do. In 1875, a week before he was 83, he went to sleep and he never got up. You think about this guy. When he was born, George Washington was president and he outlived Abraham Lincoln. And when he died, Ulysses Grant was president. And most people in most books I'm reading are saying no one influenced 19th century America more than Finney. Nobody. He started the second great awakening by the grace of God. He unified the nation around the Bible. He was the loudest voice against slavery until the Civil War started. He opened up doors for women to minister in America for the first time ever. So any one of you that's ever benefited from a female preacher from America, your Joyce Meyer, your Christine Kane, your Gloria Copelands, it's because it's because of Charles Finney. He laid the foundation for that. His teachings on the Holy Spirit and holiness really opened the doors for the Pentecostals to have some good teaching. And all over the world today, right now, right now, this second, people are doing evangelism the Finney way. With altar calls, with prayer meetings before the meeting, with people praying during the meeting, with people expecting results, telling everybody they can get saved, preaching for a decision. All of that came from Finney challenging this orthodox Calvinism. D.L. Moody modeled his ministry on Finney. Billy Graham modeled his ministry on Finney. What an example that his legacy is still impacting the world right now. Right now, there's some evangelists. They might not even know his name. They might be in Africa or Asia, but they're preaching the gospel the way Finney preached the gospel because we found out that's how we do it. We call people to make a decision for Christ. I believe that the United Kingdom needs a few Finneys. Amen. It needs a few people who say, I'm going to pray some big prayers. And I'm going to get some big answers. I'm going to share my faith. And I'm going to commit to the truth. I'm going to be committed to local church. Committed to what God's going to do in my generation. I'm not going to sit back and go, I wish I was alive when Finney was alive. Because this way I get to stand on his shoulders. He doesn't get to stand on mine. And we're going to stand on what he says. That, that, that quote comes from Isaac Newton, by the way. He says, if I can see as far as I see, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. It's written on the outside of the two-pound coin quote from Isaac Newton. And so we can stand on the shoulders of all these giants we've been talking about. You know, this is our 16th week. We can stand on the shoulders of all these people and we can see further than they've seen and we can impact this nation for the glory and goodness of God. You know, so thank God for Charles Finney's life, but he's dead. I once went to an Assemblies of God church to preach. I knew the pastor, didn't know the church. The pastor wasn't there when I preached. I was asked to preach because he was away. And so I didn't know anyone in the church. And it was just a bit, I don't know, just a bit unfocused. And I thought, I need to get these guys focused. And so I got up and I hit the pulpit and I said, you know, I'm more anointed than the Apostle Paul. I'm more anointed than John Wesley. I'm more anointed than Smith Wigglesworth. And I had everyone's attention, man. Who is this pipsqueak saying that? And I said, of course I do, because they're dead. They don't have the power to lift any burden or destroy any yoke. That's what the anointing does, isn't it? They don't have the power to do that anymore. Do they? But we do. We have an anointing from the Holy One, First John 2.20. We can impact our generation. So take that legacy. Take that baton off him. He wanted to pass the baton on to you. Take what you've learned. Go and read some of his books. Read his lectures on revival. You know? 
and learn and grow and develop and start to pray some big prayers for our nation. Amen. Awesome. Praise God. Well, listen, guys, thank you so much for being part of this this evening. Let me just let you know what's going on. Give you a few notices. Okay. So we've got prayer on Facebook every day this week. We have prayer Monday to Friday at 2 p.m., Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. And then we have our communion, our communion at 2 p.m. on Friday. So that's definitely going to go right through July, um, those prayers, because, you know, some of you are still locked down. Some of you still can't get out. And they're blessing people. They're really blessing people. So get yourself to those. Tree.church slash Facebook Live is the quickest way to get to the link. Tuesday night, Chris and Vaughn are doing their Chris and Vaughn song time. Man, they have been so much joy and freedom and laughter. And they've been awesome. Get yourself to those. And then um, on Saturday night, next Saturday, we've still got Richard and uh, Lee. I haven't got any um, graphics for them, sorry. But Richard is preaching on Friday night. And Lee is preaching on Wednesday night. And they're going to be great messages, both on Facebook. And then Saturday night, I'm going to continue our series on having faith in God's grace. And I'm going to answer this question. How can I move God? How can I get God to heal me? How can I get God to, to bless me? How can I get God to send revival to this nation? Well, how can we? Can we? And I'm going to answer that on Saturday night, part of our series on Have Faith in God's Grace. And then Sunday morning, you know, we're talking about the fact that faith moves forward. Do you know that all 12 apostles moved forward? Apart from one. One moved backwards. And so we're going to look at the life of Judas Iscariot. And we're going to learn how not to backstab our friends and how not to walk backwards and how to move forwards with God. Because every one of those apostles moved forward apart from Judas. And then next week, we're continuing our Champions of the Faith. And we're going to have a look at Catherine Kuhlman, the healing evangelist. Um, started ministry in 1933, would you believe? And uh, continued ministering right up until the 70s. And so we're going to have a great time looking at her life and her ministry next Sunday night. Same time, half past six on YouTube, on Facebook, and on the church online. And you are more than welcome to be there. So my name is Ben Conway. It's been a joy to be with you. If you want to watch this sermon again, it'll be on YouTube. And about as soon as, but virtually as soon as we click the finish button, it'll be on YouTube, tree.church slash YouTube. And if you want more teaching from me, go to my blog, treeoflifeblog.com. Um, I'm in the middle of a series on discipleship right now, which will really bless you, treeoflifeblog.com. If you live in the UK and want to hear me preach, go to tree.church slash dial a sermon. And I'll give you a phone number. You pick it up and you can listen to me on your phone. And if you want to join our email list and find out all the exciting things happening at Tree of Life, tree.church slash email. And you can join our email list. And we send out two emails a week. One is a teaching email and the other one is announcements. The teaching one normally comes on Monday. The announcements normally come on Thursday. Well, what a joy it's been to study Finney's Life together. Let me just double check, see how people are doing. Um, thank you, Jesus, for your servant. Absolutely, Audrey. What a man of God Finney was. Akalia, we have the right to influence others and the power to do it. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Jill was blessed. Awesome. Michelle was blessed. Amanda was blessed. I'm glad. I'm only actually talking to Amanda. Everyone else is just a guest here today. Um, Daniel Maria, uh, Ashley and Anna, Sue, Victoria, Patience, Amanda, Catherine Coleman. You're excited about Catherine Coleman. Good, good. Uh, thank you, Anita. Thank you, Bimbo. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Esther. All right. Bless you guys. I'm out of here. I'm going to put my feet up. Um, have a rest, well deserved rest after a long weekend. Love you guys. Have a great, great rest of your evening. Uh, thanks, Carl. Really appreciate that. We'll see you guys all 